I'm trying uh, Great Grandpa Bob's hunting rifle. It's like a hundred years old or something. <laughs> From the tradition steeped old school John Browning designed Model 94 that daughter Julia just inherited from her great grandfather, to Broby's Glenfield Model 30 done space cowboy style. Again this year, the lever action 3030 has captured our imagination. And I feel like we're not alone in this fascination because the most popular video I've ever made shared a 2020 hunting adventure featuring my Winchester Model 94 chambered in 3030, and I used it to put a cow moose just like this one into our family's freezer. The cartridge has been around a really long time. First offered more than 125 years ago as a smokeless powder offering for the general public. And despite many ballistically superior, more modern cartridges to choose from today, there's still a dizzying array of different ammunition offerings available for the good old 3030. So which one to choose? If you're embarking on the classic reasonably close range wooded whitetail hunt, I don't think it matters much as a mountain of deer have fallen to their cartridge over the years, including many that have fed my family. So this whitetail doe is right to stomp and blow because she's in big trouble if I can nail my marksmanship. It's also slain a lot of moose over the years, and common consensus would seem to suggest that 170 grain or heavier projectiles are probably what you want for a drama-free moose harvest. But this year, it wasn't either deer or moose we were most interested in, rather North American elk, which my daughter and I were both fortunate to draw tags for. Setting out to hunt elk together with our 3030s, that would be a dream come true. So we hit the online forums to see what folk thought about the various ammunition choices out there, but were surprised when blasted instead with an unbelievable amount of vitriol that went something along the lines that the 3030 was so underpowered it would be unethical for use on elk. Yes, it's impossible to refute the fact that elk are substantially larger than deer, and this difference is obvious even when simply seeing the two greys together. In fact, your average elk is four times more massive than your average white-tailed deer. But then consider that your average cow moose is almost twice again as big. When thinking about this and the 3030's proven track record on moose, it became really hard for me to accept the idea that within reasonable constraints, the 3030 couldn't handle elk. So as the online conversations switched to pseudo-psychoanalytical comparisons between the three animals, we instead set out to collect some data we'd used to pick a bullet because there was no way we weren't going to try. With an exception made for two solid monolithic bullet offerings, we made an early decision to only test bullets heavier than 150 grains, and our goal was to test their performance characteristics across a range of distance to target. Proper ballistics gel would have been expensive, so as a cost-saving measure, we went with swamp water and Rubbermaid tubs as our terminal ballistic media. We fired multiple rounds into the water-filled tubs, starting from 150 meters, then moving up to 100, and finally 50 meters. It was really fun to watch all the water splash around, but even better to see which tub the bullets wound up in and their recovered condition. We also wanted to know how fast each bullet was traveling just before it hit. So we made the risky move of setting the chronograph up immediately in front of the target to collect velocity readings across our distance range of interest. Starting at 5 meters, moving through 50 and 100 meters, and finishing at 150 meters. The result of all this effort was a big pile of data we gleefully compiled into Microsoft Excel and then used to plot a variety of different velocity curves which I think do a great job of illustrating how each projectile bleeds speed. This is what you're looking at now, and if you're interested, I'll quickly walk through each bullet we looked at, starting with the barn's 150 grain solid copper TSX, a hollow point designed especially for the 3030. It's one of two exceptions we made to our must be greater than 150 grain rule, and we hand loaded it using factory barn's load data. The result was the fastest muzzle velocity of everything we tested but you can see that it also shed velocity faster than anything else we tested. This really showed in the bullets we recovered from our water testing, revealing a very high level of sensitivity in the projectile's expansion characteristics as a function of velocity. Looking at these three fired bullets, I think I'd be pretty happy with the 50 and 100 meter results, 
but way less confident that what we're seeing at 150 meters would be optimal if we're hunting critters bigger than your average whitetail. Next was a Barnes factory load which used their original 190 grain flat nose bullet. It clocked in at the other end of the spectrum with the lowest muzzle velocity of everything we tested, but interesting that despite its gargantuan flat met plate, it has pretty good sectional density and consequently a reasonably high ballistic coefficient resulting in pretty tame deceleration. Bullets recovered from our water tests exhibit excellent expansion at the 50 and 100 meter marks and great weight retention too. But by 150 meters, the projectile in its factory loading has shed enough velocity that expansion becomes much more limited. On their website, manufacturer Barnes also publishes load data for this bullet some of it indicating the potential for velocities quite a bit higher than what we experienced with their factory loading. Using this data, we worked up some hand loads to try and headed back out for some more slew water and chronograph protocol. Here's a quick recap of the velocity curve generated with the original factory load, and this is the improvement realized by using Barnes's hand loading data. It got us right around an extra 100 feet per second, and you can see that this incremental velocity, well, it pretty much carries throughout the entire curve. So no surprises then on the recovered bullets, which still show excellent 90% weight retention, but also decent improvement in the expansion of the slug fired from 150 meters. Overall impression? Pretty cool. Now moving on, here's the other exception to our minimum mass rule. Hornady's 3030 Specialized Solid Copper Monolithic Bullet weighing in at a measly 140 grains. Being the lightest bullet of everything we tested, I was expecting the fastest muzzle velocity, but you can see by looking at the front end of this velocity curve that I was a bit disappointed at being unable to find a safe hand load that beat out the Barnes 150 grain mono. This disappointment aside, check out the other end of the curve. It really reveals how much flat nose bullets are aerodynamically handicapped and remarkable the advantage imparted by Hornady's out of the box thinking that resulted in their groundbreaking elastomer tip. Recovered bullets, they were pretty interesting too, all exhibiting good expansion and they would have averaged greater than 99% weight retention had not that one little pedal been torn from the slug recovered in the 150 meter test. The next one we looked at was Spears 170 grain hot core flat nose bullet. Our maximum realized safe hand loaded velocity? About 2200 feet per second and this is right on par with most 170 grain factory loaded offerings. It shed this velocity at about the same rate as the Hornady Mono, suggesting pretty optimized aerodynamics for a flat nose bullet. An examination of our recovered bullets indicated moderate expansion and about 90% weight retention, but also one pretty serious jacket core separation that makes me wonder if I'd be okay using this on my dream elk hunt. The next thing we tried was the legendary 170 grain Remington core lock in its factory loading with a muzzle velocity again in the neighborhood of about 2200 feet per second. I was really excited to test this bullet as I think its gigantic exposed flat nose looks awesome. But it turns out you sure pay for it in the drag department as it quickly bleeds speed. Recovered bullets mostly mimicked their deadliest mushroom in the woods monkey but now check out this catastrophic jacket failure. It happened twice in our test protocol and when it did, we recovered all the pieces in the first water tub so I think it's happening pretty early in the terminal media and not something I think would be good in the front shoulder of our dream hunt elk. So how about an expensive bonded bullet? The only choice we could find was Federal's 170 grain fusion and I was only able to locate two boxes of it which is too bad because we really like this bullet. On par 2200 feet per second muzzle velocity and pretty optimized aerodynamic shape made for a reasonably high performing velocity curve and recovered bullets while they exhibited near 100% weight retention awesome expansion and no nasty jacket core separations. If we could have found more supply of this loaded ammunition, I think it's what we would have chosen. Now on the other end of the availability spectrum in our year of the lever elk was Winchester 170 grain power point, a rounded flat nose factory offering that again clocked in with a muzzle velocity of about 2200 feet per second 
And it's another example of how much that big flat nose actually costs with respect to downrange velocity. And despite shedding lots of pieces of jacket and core for about 80% weight retention, as well as pretty decent expansion, we didn't experience any of that nasty jacket separation business. So, if we could hunt within a reasonable range to manage trajectory limitations, it might be a good choice, especially given its widespread availability, which would allow us a good amount of practice. Next, we tried the Sierra 170 grain Pro Hunter flat nose. Safe handloading practice was only able to realize about 2,150 feet per second, but on the other end of our velocity curve, it seemed to hold speed pretty comparable with its peers. Recovered bullets mostly showed nice expansion and greater than 90% weight retention, but we also experienced a couple of instances where the jacket was completely torn from the core. Now a recurring theme with cup and core bullets designed for the 3030, this made me wish we could have found some more bonded bullets to try. The last flat nose bullet we tested was Hornady's 170 grain interlock, and while it clocked in as fastest in class at the muzzle, again that big flat nose sure costs in the downrange department. Expansion and weight retention were also best in class, but despite being another cup and core bullet, we did not experience any of that nasty jacket core separation. And I think this begins to reveal a trend in our testing around cantilever location as a dominant factor in cup and core bullet terminal integrity. Now lastly, what kind of 33 bullet review could possibly be complete without considering Hornady's elastomer-enabled Spitzer-styled boat-tailed 160 grain FTX? We knew we had to try it. And when we did, it's pretty easy to see how awesome it is for managing trajectory, thus extending the range of the 3030, as its velocity profile blew everything else out of the water. But all these considerations to manage external ballistics come at some cost in the terminal performance department, because of all the bullets we tested, this one exhibited the least amount of weight retention, and with that cantilever so close to the bullet tip, it doesn't need to expand much before there's nothing left to hold the core and jacket together. Thus, not surprisingly, we experienced a few results where that jacket and core totally came apart, particularly at close range. We also tried each load in a variety of 3030 rifles to test for accuracy. You can see we had some surprises, which for us quickly eliminated some bullet-gun combinations right off the bat, like the Barnes 190 grain original and my Marlin 336 TS. Now, time to choose, with our favor falling on the 170 grain Hornady interlock as it ticked the boxes for accuracy, good expansion, good weight retention, and no jacket core separations. But the downside would be quick velocity fall off and thus poor trajectory, which could be manageable with smart hunting and range constrained within 150 meters. Despite that distance being reasonably short range, I knew that at last light my aging eyes could use some help, so I'd set up my Marlin 336 TS with an aim point acro, and after practice to both ring out the gun and my camera skills, we set out for a hunting warm-up of sorts in the month-long general deer season that preceded our window for winter elk. Before we take you along for those adventures though, let's explore a little bit the current situation for chronic wasting disease in our province and how it influences some of the decisions we make in what and where we hunt. Our province runs a world-renowned CWD monitoring program and every year collects many deer heads for testing. These are donated by hunters and even though participation is still voluntary in the areas where we hunt, we submit the head of every deer we kill, both because I'd hate to feed my kids CWD contaminated meat and because I feel happy I get to contribute to what I think is pretty important research. Results are published annually and they indicate that mule deer are disproportionately affected, especially mule deer bucks. So despite having pretty good opportunity to hunt them in our neck of the woods, we now give them a free pass with respect to putting them on our dinner plate. And also interesting is a perspective we received from a professor emeritus of veterinary pathology that I hang out with the odd day at the clay range. He indicates that older animals are also much more likely to test positive. So what then to hunt for meat? Elk, whitetail, female, and young. With all that in mind, it was a really windy early season afternoon as I worked my way in to hide in a finger of mature spruce that made up for one edge of some second cut hay enveloped by forest. As evening set in, the wind died down 
and deer reliably started filtering out of the woods. A white-tailed fawn presented within easy shooting distance, and when it looked like she'd eaten her fill and was about to slip back into the woods, I pulled back the hammer on my 336TS, found that red dot in the right place, and slowly squeezed. Shot through her heart and both lungs, tracking was quick and simple as she'd fallen only about 20 meters into the woods. And as I approached, the experience was rich with that unique pang of complex emotion that comes when you've killed something beautiful. Snow fell the following week, and the first evening of my next hunt, I found myself glassing a gimpy-antlered yearling white-tailed buck who looked like he had enough fat on him that we could make soap for at least the whole year. He slipped into the woods as the sun went down, so in the early darkness of the following morning, I set up Woodside to hold tight. Turns out I didn't have to wait for long. Blah! I'd hit a bit high and missed his heart, but the bullet touched both lungs and severed his aorta in such a way that he only went about 50 meters while bleeding from both entry and exit wounds. Next weekend, the weather was unusually warm, which I took advantage of to set up in the early afternoon in a nook along the sandy pine ridge that overlooked some grass that was still green. I dozed off to snooze for a couple of hours in that glorious sunshine and woke to the sound of inbound does jumping the fence to dodge an insisting buck. They came skidding to a halt to stare as they saw my movement to set up, and I was lucky because they stared a little too long. There she is, about 50 meters from where I shot her. And with that, my last deer tag was filled. But not to be outdone, daughter Julia then scored just before last light with her great granddad's Model 94, topping off this year's hunt for Whitetail. We'd used hand-loaded Hornady 170 grain flat nose bullets for all our deer and experienced four complete pass-throughs on four different deer. Pretty comforting, if you ask me, as a prelude to our elk hunt. All our heads were submitted to Alberta's CWD monitoring program, and about four weeks later, we were ecstatic when four negative test results came back. The setting for our elk hunt was awesome. A herd of about 150 were bedding in a wooded neighboring property adjacent to ours and coming out late afternoon to graze another neighbor's second cut hay. When they started midnight mauling his bales, he suggested we set up within them to hunt the tree line. Imagine our horror then to discover that as the general hunting season closed and our special elk season started, a forest clearing project mobilized within a property bordering the bush where the elk were bedded. Talking with the crew, we learned there were only about 40 to 50 acres to be cleared and that it would only take them about a week and a bit. When finished, I think it's probably going to improve the elk habitat in the years to come, but as that work kicked off, the herd of 150 we'd set our hopes on, well... It straight up vanished. The crew worked hard through decent weather, and I have to admit it was pretty interesting to see their specialized equipment process all that timber. The newly cleared area will be prepped for hay come spring, and while there's lots of forest left for the elk to bed in, in the years to come it'll be fascinating to see firsthand the impact this kind of habitat fragmentation has on the deer, the moose, and the elk that make up such an important part of our lives. Delightful for us then that five days after the clearing crew left, about a dozen elk returned. I imagine others had hunted them pretty hard wherever they'd gone, whereas before they'd come out early and freely graze the hay, they were much more cautious now, staying bedded longer, and when they did emerge much closer to sunset, they'd only hug the tree line coming no closer than 250 meters. The end of the season was only a couple days away now, and we knew we'd have to change gears. 
we decided that a 3030 elk was still our goal, but needing more range than the red dot or irons would allow, we pulled the red dot off the space cowboy gun and then set it up instead with a low power variable that has an externally adjustable elevation turret. I also swallowed all those earlier reservations about close range jacket core separation and pulled out the Hornady 160 grain FTX then hurriedly carved out some range time to prove up trajectory measurements so we could confidently dial for elevation. With the gun zeroed at 100 meters, we learned we'd need 8 inches of elevation at 200 and a whooping 36 inches at 300. Now the last night we had to hunt, we'd set up in the cover of the bales and with about 10 minutes of legal light left, the elk started clearing the tree line into the hay. With only a few minutes to go and at 310 meters to the closest cow, it was now or never. You got her. You fucking got her. And in a moment that passed by at the very last minute, but also way too quickly, our 2023 hunt for elk was done. We gutted her where she fell, and our super nice neighbor even brought up the tractor, which made moving and skinning our elk a breeze. Talk about a huge animal though. Peeling back her hide revealed our anchoring high shoulder shot, a trajectory passing just beneath her spine, and no exit wound. The butcher didn't find the bullet either, so I suspect it's waiting for someone to discover in a shoulder roast we cook in the months to come. All in though, the experience of last year's hunt makes me grateful to live where I do, to have the neighbors that we have, and especially for my family with whom I get to share the whole nine yards. Thanks so much for watching, and until next year, take care.